Okay, so today we've got Daniel Foray because he's a wellbeing lead at Rolls Royce Marines. Uh, so Daniel didn't actually start off as um, a wellbeing lead. He started off as a mythologist, uh, but he's completed his master's in psychology whilst working at Rolls Royce and he's recently been appointed as the new wellbeing lead for submarines. So <clears throat> I won't get into too much. I'm sure we're going to talk about it a bit later on, but He's basically in charge of training and educating staff and the importance of well-being. Um, he's there to drive and improve our <clears throat> well-being strategy across um, World War submarines and um, basically champion, champion the cause. So, Dan, without further ado, mate, it's over, over to you. Thank you, mate. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. And um, I, I would just like to start by apologising for the late rearrangement of, uh, of this from a few weeks ago. I was stuck out of the country. Um, but now I'm, I'm resolutely in the UK now. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, right. So, first of all, I would like to start by stopping. So, I'd like you to take a second and ask yourself, are you OK? And take a breath, take a second, ignore that little British voice that goes, yeah, I'm fine. And then actually ask yourself, are you really OK? Now, the answer to that might be no, but it's important to recognise it because asking yourself that and answering honestly is the first step towards being better. I bet you probably don't do that very often. I probably don't do it as often as I should, and I'm the one here telling you that you should do it. So please do take this time regularly just check in with yourself and see are you okay life moves at 100 miles an hour so even if you can take 30 seconds for yourself it's a good thing to be doing so i've got a couple of things here um that you could potentially use um to help yourself i can send these across afterwards um so <clears throat> we have a uh, a personal energy audit at rolls royce um which you can see sort of uh you score yourself on, uh, on a variety of different aspects of your life. How many of these have you checked? And then you get a score at the end of it, which tell you that you need to manage your energy in different ways. Now you can put, say, body, emotions, mind, and spirit down at the bottom right. What do you need to work on? And then you end up with a bit of a to-do list. There's also this really useful mental health self-assessment card. And this is obviously quite top level stuff, but it's really useful just to have a glance at every now and then. Are you feeling positive or negative? Do you feel stressed, anxious or depressed? Do you feel confident to tackle the day ahead? I mean, I know it's Monday, but you know, over and above the usual. Um, if the stress bucket in check, I'll be coming onto the stress bucket a bit. So I'll leave that for now. And something else that we like to use. Um, mental health is intrinsically linked to physical health. So you need to look after your physical health as best you can to make sure you're mentally fit. So simple things, are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating well? Are you exercising? It's easy for those things to fall by the wayside, but if they do, I bet you'll have a mental hit as well as a physical one. And then your internal monologue, you know, are you thinking negatively? And how do those things make you feel? So it's worth glancing at this every now and then. Um, there's some good stuff on Thrive for Life. Um, it's worth having a look at and using these to every now and then just check in with yourself and see how you're doing. So I wanted to just kind of review a um, of the last few, uh, of the last few years. Um, so dealing with uncertainty, I mean, we've obviously got COVID. Um, within Rolls Royce, we've had an awful lot of company restructuring. Had a new CEO, we've pivoted into new markets, we're putting nuclear reactors in space now, which is amazing, but it's uh, that's not an easy job. And there's a lot of uh, restructuring and people moving around, those sorts of things, plus the cost of living crisis and all of the stuff that goes along with that is a level, of, it ends up with a level of uncertainty in your life. And that uncertainty naturally breeds anxiety. That's not anything wrong that's a natural human response to uncertainty and obviously there's four fairly big points there obviously one of those is just specific to us but i bet through covid your companies have changed quite a lot as well so we've had quite a lot and that will result in high anxiety um obviously during covid we 
lost access to our coping strategies. So going back to our previous the previous thing, our, my my coping strategy is five side football. Um, it's it, I like it, I was playing it two three times a week up until March 2020, and uh, and then I wasn't able to do it anymore, and I really didn't deal with it very well. I um I sort of I, I well I, I, like a lot of people I uh, I suppose I I drank more than I should. I didn't get out and do alternative forms of exercise i've realized over the years that i don't like running i don't like anything solitary i need to do team sports it's the only thing that works for me um and it's only in the last sort of eight months or so that i've properly got back to a decent routine so it's quite easy you might have a look at yourself and think back and go well what, what did i used to do what were my hobbies that maybe i haven't done for a while uh, those things are really important but just uh, through this and all the way through, it's important just to note that your experience isn't the same as anybody else's. There's no shoulds here. It's a very, very individual thing. They summed it up quite nicely, I think. Do you have a mental health problem? Are you responding rationally to a crazy situation? To say the stress and anxiety as a result of uncertainty is a natural evolutionary human reaction. You're not crazy but it can still cause detrimental effects. So what do those look like? Well, uh, so these are your classic symptoms of anxiety and depression, your two biggest mental ill health uh, types. Uh, so what do they look like? Um, loss of pleasure in usual activities, um, demotivated and withdrawn. You know, you can't, can't be bothered to leave the house, don't even want to go to the pub and see your mates, what's the point, can't be bothered with it. A lower libido, another physical thing. Appetite changes and sleep changes, the change being the important point on those. If you typically sleep for five hours a night um, and are perfectly fine with that, you know, you're running like Mackie Thatcher, hopefully in that way exclusively. Uh, but then say you start sleeping nine, 10, 11 hours a night, then that's that's a noteworthy change and it's something that should be explored if you can similarly the other way around um and appetite changes yeah if you're suddenly start eating loads or not very much um personally for me that's one if i if i start eating lots i'm a, I'm a comfort eater so that's one of my little uh things to keep an eye on mood changes um irritated snappy short-tempered tearful um, then your classic anxiety, sort of unable to switch off on worries, mind racing, and your very classic depression, feeling sad or low most or all of the time. Now, I think a lot of us know these, but it's really useful just to remind ourselves of them, just in case you're not looking inward very often and you see these in some way. If a few of those chime with you, then that's worth investigating further. But... I didn't just want to talk about these. Uh, I wanted to talk about burnout because I think it's something that we've all, we're all uh, quite, uh, well, we're, we're, a lot of us are suffering from, and it's uh, it's sort of a very prevalent in our working ways at the moment. So what is it? Um, well, in 1974, the term was coined, but somehow it took until 2019 for the World Health Organization to officially classify it as a medical diagnosis. Um, which is ludicrous, frankly. Um, so what is it? It's a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that's not been successfully managed. I specifically underlined workplace stress to point out that it's rubbish. Um, of course, your work plays an important factor in these sorts of things, but you can have stress from various different aspects of your life that can lead to you burning out. It doesn't have to be workplace based. Um, so despite the definition, don't just think that it has to be a work thing exclusively. But to say it results from stress, it's not the same as it. So you can't cure it by taking some time off or doing sort of meditation or anything like that. <clears throat> Though those things might help, they won't necessarily, they won't cure burnout. When you're burnt out, you're out of gas, you've given up all help, hope, if you're, you're running on fumes it's not an overnight thing it builds up over time it can be sort of one of those things that's um, sort of like the fall of rome like um happens very very slowly and then all at once but ultimately 
you feel like work's too much, time's too short, stress is too great, too many plates spinning, I can't handle this. What does it look like? You've got some internal and external symptoms. Your emotional exhaustion, cynicism, detachment, again, that sort of can't be bothered to go out of the house, isolating yourself from people, feeling ineffective, that drained before beginning and anxiety before work, like if that's a if that sort of Monday morning feeling, if that's an every morning feeling, that might be an issue. Pessimism and loss of motivation. And then your external ones, these are useful to know um, because you might recognize them in yourselves and some of them you might notice in other people. So what are those? Physical exhaustion, insomnia, forgetfulness, impaired concentration, of course, these things can exacerbate the problem as well sometimes. Again, that isolation and escapism is worth looking out for that in colleagues and friends. Uh, increased irritability, that snappiness again. Lowered immunity. We don't often think about the mental things and the physical things being so readily intertwined, but they are. Um, your immunity will be affected if you're mentally burnt out. Procrastinating, that anxiety before work and the drain before beginning can lead to you just putting things off. Uh, again, those changes, uh, the increase in food, drug, alcohol. Uh, say at the start of the pandemic, I, uh, I was drinking more than I should have done, eating too much, easy to do. And another physical one, the, the physical pain, headaches particularly, if you've got a lot of stress that you're carrying around, a lot of that results in muscular tension in your neck, and that will lead to headaches. So if you're getting regular headaches, that might be a symptom to keep an eye on. Now, I work for Rolls-Royce, so I'm contractually obligated to show you a graph, but I like this one, it's good. Um, so this is your pressure and performance graph. So you've got pressure on your x-axis and performance on your y. So if we start on the left-hand side, you've got boredom, you've got very little to do, and it's easy to become disengaged when that's the case. So you're Obviously, the, the limit there's a limit to how high that could go, but you're also operating well within even the work that you've got. The work that you'll you'll be doing, as limited as that might be, will be of low quality because you're not really exerting any mental effort. <laughs> Moving to the right from there, this boredom's quite a small bit, but then you've got comfort. Now, that's when you know you you know what you're doing. You you you're kind of turning the handle. Everything's fine. You've been doing your job for a while. Everything's just sort of as it was. And your performance level is fine, it's decent, no one's going to complain too much. But then you get this sort of this optimum zone, which is in, in psychological terms, it's called the zone of proximal development. That's that area just slightly outside of your comfort zone, whereby you're utilizing some of your existing skills, but you're also learning new ones, and that spurs you on to be at your very, very best. So that's where you start moving into this, this stretch area and you'll respond positively to things. And that's basically where your work will be as good as it possibly can be. But it's quite a narrow zone. And once you go past that, you get over that hump and you hit strain. And where you're in strain, the pressure's too much. You start feeling tired. You've got poor judgment, poor decision-making. As I said before, those, those can exacerbate the situation. You, know, you make a mistake, you've got to redo something the deadline's closer you've got more stress to deal with and then there's a really sharp drop off from there into the crisis zone and that's where you start see seeing exhaustion serious health problems breakdown and burnout now i quite like this as a means of discussion between staff and managers um, i think if you can sort of do those introspective steps like we talked about at the start then you can potentially communicate better where you might be on this graph at any point if you do that with your manager you can say well actually you know i'm i'm right at the top of this stretch bit i'm i'm dangerously close to slipping down and you're all right okay well let's manage the workload um or if you're moving towards the left well you know i'm, I'm underutilized i'm not not being at my best at all so i um i'd like some more work or some new work some more challenging stuff and then you start moving up and doing better Excuse me one second.
Sorry about that. that was just my uh, my daughter popped in. Right. Um, so the three types of people most vulnerable to burnout. Um, so you've got you high achievers, those people who won't turn down opportunities. So their plates are always full, they're always spinning, and everything's seen as essential. Sort of similar, the people pleasers. I fall foul of this sometimes. I try and stop myself. Um, they struggle to say no, struggle to create boundaries. So then you know it, we've all seen those people or been those people whereby you're, you know, you know, you'll take on a bit of work to help somebody out, and then suddenly you're the person who's responsible for that for the next five years. It's very easy to be that person and not set those clear boundaries with people. I don't love the victim mentality thing, but it is worth um, mentioning the sort of the, the, where they mentioned sort of learned helplessness. This is, you know, the, the things suck. This is just how they are. Now that's kind of like just about negative thought spirals, and that is a, a worthwhile thing, even if I don't like the terminology. It's very easy to sort of get yourself into this negative spiral whereby you'll only end up exacerbating the negative sides of things. Now I've got you three types of burnout. So is this, um, despite well, sort of only mentioning burnout on the right-hand side of that graph, the left-hand side of that graph is burnout as well. When you're, you've got nothing going on, you're feeling stuck, you're not sure what to do next. I was in this last year, honestly. I, um, I got on a secondment and then my previous role wasn't available for me to come back to because someone else had filled it and it was all sort of fine but then I was just sort of floating around didn't have anything to do and for two weeks it was amazing I just sat on my playstation had a really lovely time and then every day that went past that I enjoyed it less and less and less it's very very easy to slip into that then you got your classic volume one back to back work everything feels out of control you're running on empty and then going back to the bit with the underlining earlier, social. So it's not just your work life. It can come to, let, let's say you've had a really busy week. You've done, you know, 45, 50 hours of work during the week, Monday to Friday. You get home and then your calendar is booked. You've got the in-laws to go and see. You've got to drive across the country to see friends. Now that might be a really lovely thing to do, but it can frankly add to your stress levels and give you less time to relax so as useful as social interaction is and it absolutely is it's worth just thinking about your entire life with this sort of thing and occasionally you do just have to say i'm sorry not this weekend so i've uh, i've sort of banged on about the the problems but what can you do about them so the key word is managing these aren't bruises that fade with time. Some stuff will get better with time, you know, a project ends or whatever, but frankly, you've got a lot more control than that. So the thing to do really is to get a management plan in place, a structure. You won't wait until you feel better to start exercising. So why are you treating your brain in the same way? So take a pause, that's fine. And that might, you know, that, that might be legitimately some time off sick, um, but that won't do anything in and of itself. It's important to use that time effectively, take practical steps. So I mentioned it before, um, we use this stress bucket exercise in Rolls-Royce and I find it immensely useful. So I won't go through it in a huge amount of detail. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. The concept is that you have this bucket and in that bucket, goes everything that causes you stress again home life and work life so you know i've got um managerial training to write i've got um a bunch of processes that i'm working on i have a nearly six-year-old daughter who comes in and interrupts webinars i'm a tottenham hotspur fan that fills it right to the brim um and then you have a tap and that tap is your coping strategies again my, for me my fiber side football my seeing friends i have I, to occasional board game nights, that sort of thing. And that will drain off your stress levels and keep it at a manageable level. So let's give you 30 seconds or so, just have a think to yourself. Feel free to scribble notes to yourself. I'm not gonna ask you to share anything, but just think about the things in and out of work that cause you stress.
So then the key is to ask you, ask yourself some questions. What are some of my unhelpful coping strategies? So I say for me, um, I, I overeat and occasionally overdrink. Not helpful, really, in the grand scheme of things. Um, be helpful coping strategies. Again, for me, five-side football, seeing friends, useful, good stuff. Are there any items in your bucket that you can change? Just eliminate them entirely. Brilliant. Take that project off your plate or whatever. Um, are there any items that you can't change and need to accept? I think I just have to accept that occasionally my six-year-old is going to interrupt webinars. That's fine. I just have to learn to live with it. Um, what needs my urgent attention? Obviously, that's a key one because um, that will go along potentially with what can you change? Can you just tackle something and eliminate it? So it needs, it needs urgent attention, but also you can eliminate it from being in your bucket entirely from then on. So it's really, really useful if you can get it out of the way. And then the key one that we really don't like asking ourselves, can anyone help me? I think we all probably fall foul of not asking for help as often as we should, but I always like to think about it from the other perspective. If anyone's ever come to me and asked me for help, I've never thought negatively of them for doing so. So why should I be scared to ask somebody else for help? Always well, try and put yourself in their shoes and think how would I react if the shoe was on the other foot? Now, similarly to that, I talk about setting boundaries. So we quite often think setting boundaries will sound like I'm not capable of doing that, or I don't want to be helpful, or I'm not wanting to work as hard as somebody else, but it doesn't. It just sounds like I don't have the capacity to do that without compromising somewhere else. And we all know you can't do everything. It can't be, you know, it's cost, quality, and time. Like you can't have everything. Something has to compromise. So just you have to learn that that's how it sounds. It's not as bad as it first seems. So I'm going to give you some phrases for setting boundaries at work. Again, I like to think of these from the opposite perspective. If anyone's ever said these to me, they sound perfectly reasonable. Can I check my calendar and get back to you on whether I have the capacity to support that? No, yeah, fair enough. Not going to argue with that. Might have to chase them for an answer in an hour or two, but yeah, why not? Clarifying priorities. Well, I'm working on these three things and I can rearrange stuff if you need. What, what's the priority? Yeah, fair enough. I mean, that might, you know, involve your, have to involve your manager, but it's a perfectly legitimate question to ask. Similarly, oh, well, I don't have the capacity to do all of the stuff, but I could help you with one bit of it. Is that helpful? Well, if the answer is no, they know where you stand. That's perfectly fair. And certain expectations. Yeah, of course I can help. That's not a problem at all, but it'll be next week. Is that fine? Again, they might say no, but that's no, oh, that's okay. So, what boundaries are you going to put in place today to protect yourself or start to lift yourself out of burnout? I'm going to give you 30 more seconds to think about that. So I've uh, found out about what you can do, um, but um, there's support available. Well, it's important to remember that. So what are they? Now, I don't know your companies, but maybe some of them have got mental health first aiders. If they do, use them. They're fantastic. I've been one for about five years, six years now. Um, it's incredibly rewarding, and everyone else who's ever done it with me has been amazing. They, they've helped me, and I've seen them help other people. If your company doesn't have mental health first aiders, I'd encourage them to get some trained. If you might be interested yourself, it's a it's a really great thing to do. Um, Mind, uh, obviously, uh, they're an amazing charity. Um, there's a hundred local branches across England and Wales, but you could also be um, you get support online. Um, that doesn't need to be interactive. That can be tips, information. 
and they've also got helplines. They're amazing. Please do reach out to them if you think could be of use. Your friends, um, this gives the corny stock photo, um, but your friends are an amazing resource. They're incredible. They don't need to be trained. They don't need to be qualified. They know you better than you know you probably. Um, lean on them, open up, talk. Um, sometimes that's all that people need. Um, in my mental health first aid position, I've often just had people wanting to get stuff off their chest because maybe they don't feel they can do it at home or whatever. And then they feel better just for having shared or they'll talk it through and come to a realization or come up with a plan themselves whilst talking. And there's the NHS, because so um, much lambasted, but an amazing resource. Um, you know, counseling services, um, information and advice, again, on the uh, mental health website for the NHS. Obviously, if you need it, medication can be very, very useful. Um, and again, I just want to highlight the fact that if you might need it, time off from work is not a bad thing. Um, I've had it myself. I've taken three months off when I needed it, and it was one of the best things I ever did. Um, so don't be shy of asking for that. Your GP will be able to help um, and guide you towards whether they think you need it. Um, so please do reach out to them if you think that you might need that help. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I might have spoken quite quickly. I did blast through this a little bit. But um, if you have any questions or want to have a chat, then please speak up. I don't have any questions yet. Dan, do you have any questions? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wondering how, how have you found it, uh, you know, starting off as sort of, it's a new position, I'm guessing, with, you know, getting management by and if they've been quite open to, to the fact and, you know, giving you resources and time to be able to carry out the role effectively? Uh, mostly, yeah. Um, it, it took a little while to convince them. Um, so I, I've been sort of banging this drum for a few years since doing the mental health first aider position. Um, but, um, well, we're an engineering company, uh, so I, I hit them with data repeatedly for years. And, and honestly, I think the pandemic helped. I think, you know, the um, the conversation has shifted a little bit. The stigma has reduced a little bit. People are talking about this and its importance more. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I collated our previous year's absence data broken down by type and showed that we were losing um, something like two million pounds a year in salary to people who were off with mental health absences. Um, so upon doing that, um, our new executive team have been incredibly supportive. Um, they're happily investing in me, knowing full well that you know, it's not just a nice thing. They, that it goes back to that graph. You know, If you look after your workers and manage their workload and their brains well, then they'll give you better work and more work. So it's, um, it's a win-win, really, if you can invest some time and money in this. Um, they've been they've been fantastic since then. Great, thank you for that. I was just wondering, actually, if people are trying to persuade their employers that mental health first aiders is a good idea, where do you think they can find the data to prove that that spending money will actually save money in the long run? Uh, so there's a there's a Deloitte study. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but if you search Deloitte um, mental health. Um, they have uh, conducted evidence, uh, conducted research to suggest that there's a five pound return for every one pound spent on mental health interventions. Um, and in the grand scheme of uh, company spending, the mental health first aid, of course, is remarkably cheap. It's a couple of hundred quid, something like that. Um, and that's the a, mental health first aid England is a, is a useful resource for that sort of thing as well. That's a really good return on investment, isn't it? Especially if it's, you've got the people who are willing and capable to take on those roles and you've got loads of companies you know we do an, uh, like one of these engagement uh, surveys every year and we're, you know they're always talking about improving engagement en engagement and well-being are so inextricably linked you know they're, they're almost the same thing um, so fundamentally I think companies want this they might just not be talking in the same terms so force them to have that conversation um, and I say like any company you can give data to will generally take it more seriously yeah, that's what I was thinking. If you've got the facts to back it up, that's often better. So we no, you have any more questions, but I've got another one. What, yeah. It's probably a difficult one, but what do you think makes a good mental health first aider? Who or what skills? 
Um, so the one thing I think that the, 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 the training helps you with this, they do something in training called active listening, which is really, really good. Um, and it's, it's that, it's listening. It's just being open to new perspectives, um, willing to learn and all right with shutting your mouth. Um, and that's it really. It's just, it's just being interested in, in other people and caring about who they are and how they are. It's, it's really not a hard job. Um, you can, don't get me wrong, you have some difficult things that people might talk to you about yeah. um, that can be upsetting. But then hopefully if you've got other mental health first aiders, you can lean on them and that's what I've done and that's been really great. Um, but the actual role is just sitting down and talking to people. Talking is the key to all of this. Yeah, I suppose it's difficult to change your perception of trying not to fix people, but to listen to them and to understand what it is they're going through. Because I, I think I'm an engineer. Uh, <laughs> I we think have, the human we nature all... we want to fix people, don't we? We want to come up with a solution, and oftentimes I would imagine that the person suffering needs to be to draw that solution out of themselves rather than being fixed yeah, by somebody it, else. In quotes, it's not a huge tweak. I so, said like the training really helps with this. But if you if you're interested, um, look up active listening online because there's some really useful stuff. Um, and it's fundamentally like leading someone to that right, what, what you might think is the right answer or what will hopefully be the right answer for them, yeah. rather than saying, you need to do this. And obviously if you've got friends, you might know some of them might want a, or might need a bit of a sort of direct steer, but um, yeah. particularly with people you know less well, just like, well, what about, if you, have you thought about it from this perspective? And people will often lead themselves there. Yeah, it's a fascinating subject. I could talk to you all night, but fortunately we don't have all night. But thank you so much for a, a really great presentation. There's lots of food for thought there. And I think I think admitting yourself that you've got a problem is probably the first step, isn't it? And and st stop thinking people are going to think I'm stupid if I say this or say that, because oftentimes you said it in your presentation. You don't judge somebody for asking for help. So why would they judge you? Exactly. And yeah, like, I, I don't think anyone's inherently evil, or if they are, it's very few of us. So <laughs> yeah, do do just think about it from that other perspective. There's no like, you know, tarring with the mad brush or whatever, you know, it's just, it's just people trying to get by. So yeah. please lean on others and don't be shy and feel like you have to be some sort of stoic king or queen, yeah. and, you know, get some help and you'll be you'll be better. That's great. Thank you so much for giving up your valuable time tonight to deliver My this presentation for, for the RRSM East Midlands branch. Dan, do we have any last comments from you? Um, yeah, well, thanks, Dan. Thanks for coming along. Um, again, you know, uh, you couldn't help it last time. You're stuck in another country. But again, thank you very much for rescheduling. I'll have to buy you a coffee when I see you at work next. Sounds good. I'll be in in the morning. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Just to remind you that the presentation will be uploaded onto the RRSM YouTube channel in the next day or two. And for those of you who want attendance certificates, they'll be coming out this time tomorrow. So that just leaves me to thank both Dans. It's very confusing having two Dans um, for your time this evening. And we hope to see you at the next East Midlands branch webinar. Bye, everyone. Cheers, Cheers. Cheers.